Right. Um, so you you were saying that actually it wasn't too much of a surprise. Like you guys, you guys aren't stupid. It's kind of what you'd expected. Yeah, I think I think that was this. Well, I don't. I didn't poll everybody, uh, but the sense that I got from the group, and certainly my own sense, was that we had that kind of expectation. No one had told us explicitly prior, uh, and once you had said it, I think what that probably allowed the group to do was to officially sort of register in each of our minds, like, okay, so how am I to respond to this? Like, how am I intended to, re to, to react and to interact with this person? Um, uh, what's the sensitive thing to do? Is it to um, ask how you're feeling? Because that would show that you're sympathetic. Or is it to completely ignore it? Uh, because that would show that it doesn't have to stand in the way of anything. Um, or is it somewhere in the middle? Um, uh, potentially registered better through actions and gestures uh, than by words exp explicitly, or um, there's probably some, you know, mixture of, of all of those things. Yeah. Now that you touch on it, now saying, now that you mentioned it when about actions, I think actions, um, you know, it's, it's a truism, it's a cliche. They, they are much more powerful than words. And I think actually importantly in this situation they can be a lot more subtle than words you know and I think and I think that's also the same for people dealing with like grief and stuff um that you know there's there's very little that you can say that's going to make someone feel better but certainly something that like my parents found you know is like people who left like you know a, a meal like a home-cooked meal just on their doorstep just to make it that much easier um oh. Thank you. Let's that guy. God. <laughs> um yeah, suddenly my my parents found that like, you know, what was the the, the the best thing that someone could do was basically just leave like a home cooked meal on their doorstep. Like that made a lot meant a lot more to them than you, you know, just a card, I suppose. And I guess it was perhaps the same here that a small action could show that you're supporting someone without kind of rubbing it in their face. Right. Yeah. I mean, I had, I had a friend who uh, a few years ago was going through her own um, uh, cancer. Uh, and I don't remember the specifics of what she said that she wanted in during that experience, but in the, in the, in the years since, uh, I've seen her uh, uh, reinforce uh, a message over and over again, which is like um, the uh, tell me, uh, let me know if I can do anything is like not a very helpful uh, comment. Come on. Um, sorry, I just I just lost you. Um, Drop the Wi-Fi. So you said you, um, your your friend. Yeah. So I had a, uh, a friend who was going through um a cancer and the i don't recall what was wanted during that particular moment in time what was the most appropriate thing to do um but in the years since what i've heard is a refutation of the idea that this sentence is helpful uh the sentence being uh let me know if there's anything i can do yes because that, yeah. that that sort of puts the ball back in the other person's court and says, okay, so you're already going through quite a bit. You're overloaded, et cetera. Now I'm asking you to add an additional task to your day, which is think of a to-do list for me and then uh, muster up the courage to uh, communicate it such that, you know, it's, so it's just like, it's incredibly unhelpful. I remember hearing. And so instead, yeah, a home cooked meal on the front porch, um, flower i mean just anything that is an action that's just done without asking um sounds like that at least was it sounds like it resonates with both of you but i don't know how many you know is that universal or not i don't know i i think that i i don't know if it's universal but i'm pretty sure that that's like so so true like 
it's definitely what my parents felt as well. Like when when I got diagnosed and then shortly after John died, like um it's like bloody useless to say, like, you know, let me know. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Because like you you said it very well already, but like you know, it was like, oh well, maybe it would help, like if someone could do the shopping. But then you're like, oh, but is that is that something? Do you think they would actually do it? Maybe that's a bit too much to ask. You know, it's like, and it, as you say, it becomes a stress rather than an unsolicited offer. Yeah. Uh, it actually makes for a pretty interesting, I'm sure there's a blog post about it somewhere, but like, you know, if uh, most people are imaginative enough or, um, in touch enough with the other person, if they're actually the kind of person that would offer some help anyway, you would probably have a sense as to what they wanted or needed. But I wonder in the absence of knowing for sure, like what do other people who've gone through those experiences tend to think is helpful? You know, what's, what are the 20 things that if somebody just happened to offer this to me today would be nice and helpful. I'm sure like anybody could generate that list, but that might, that might be the, a bridge to help people get there more quickly. <laughs> yeah. I, at the top of my head, I would say food and cause this is me talking like healthy, nourishing food, but also nice food. But like some people would perhaps love cookies and ice cream, like. I would love like a, a really nice, yeah, dish with Quin vegetables. Quinoa and kale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I think the other thing, and again, this is me personally, is like a book or something, you know, that can be quite, you know, it's not too intrusive. It's very much like you can, you could read it if you want. And it's like no harm done if, if you don't want to. Um, so, yeah. Nice. Uh, were there any books actually that you were reading at the time, maybe prior to the course year? Because I would think the course year gave you quite a bit of reading to do. Um, were there any books that you picked up uh, during uh, during your summer of 2018? Yeah, th there are two books that really stick in my mind. Um, one of them is Shantaram by um, David Lloyd Roberts. I think that's his name. Um, you know, it's, it's a doorstopper of a book um set in in in, Bom um, in bombay it's it's kind of puts it's it's perfect for escapism because you are transport it's in the written in the first person and it transports you into this semi fantastical world not because it's not real life but because the way things just kind of um link in with each other it almost it, it's it feels like it's real but actually it's more like a film in terms of the level of convenience of narrative if that makes sense i don't mm. think i've explained it too well and so i read that book re you know when i was diagnosed as escapism the other book i read perhaps even alongside that was uh what is the what by david eggers mm. um well it's David Eggers helps bring to life someone else's story. It's almost ghostwritten by him. Um, and it's about this, uh, one of the lost boys of Sudan. Oh, um, yeah. And his journey from his village to, um, you know, which, which was, which was uh, burnt down. He saw his, you know, his, his family shot in front of his eyes. Um, and then his walk um, to a refugee camp in Kenya. And then like how, he eventually ended up in the United States. And even then, like, that was by no means, you know, um, difficulties over. But for me, that was so, it was so powerful and actually very helpful to have that as a perspective. Like, how could I scream at the world that things are so unfair? When I'm reading a true story about not just one person, but what happened to thousands of boys, and they were the lucky ones who were alive, who had to like, you know, do this journey across the desert, you know, and, and be starving. And, you know, some of them died of hunger. Some of them died of thirst. Some of them were shot on the way. Some of them got killed by wild animals. 
you know, it put in perspective how lucky I had been for the first 24 years of my life. And that wasn't going to change. Like, I have been very, very fortunate in so much. Um, so that was actually a really powerful book to read, which was by chance. I was had it already, but mm. yeah. Great. And yes, yeah, so no one dropped that on your doorstep. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> that would have been a bit of a loaded one wouldn't it yeah i think so <laughs> yeah i guess it's not just any book that would be welcome right <laughs> yes yeah um <laughs> yeah go, you know i think yeah go for something fairly safe rather than the sort of you know like how to face up to death or like at all guande's like being mortal I'm not sure that's quite appropriate <laughs> i've just changed uh, my lighting i don't know if that's any better oh oh yeah lovely lovely got all the contours of your face now so right are we back we're good yeah well it yeah. broke up for a second but uh, you're back awesome um so to go back to our time at Oxford, I guess, you know, we're at a point where we're not even friends. We're, we're, we're just about acquaintances. Um, did you feel it was difficult to try and get to know me as a person? Uh, I think so. It's also saying poor connection. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, you never know with this sort of the new uh, quarantine life of uh, video everything, <laughs> what's working yeah. and what's not. Uh, was it difficult to know you as a person? Um, I think that it was, um, but I also don't know how uniquely that was. I mean, I think your what you were going through in your outside of school experience was a compounding factor, but um, you're already a busy person, right? So you're, some, you're someone who uh, wakes up early, does a lot of sport, you know, has found other passions to focus your time on, you're in a, a relationship, um, and you go to bed really early, at least compared to <laughs> me. Uh, and so uh, I think finding windows of time uh, in uh in a life that does not also include um chemotherapy which maybe also includes rest and all kinds of things that you would all need to jam into your schedule um might have possibly been a challenge but yes i think that the um having a significant chunk of your time being devoted to an additional um uh stress or t time sink um in your life would made it um uh, acutely challenging to spend more meaningful time with you. So I think mm. that it, I say that as sort of as a framing um, for mm. uh, for my answer that like maybe on the spectrum of how easy it is to meet certain people, um, I feel like you might already um, have had a lot of your time allocated regardless, um, in my view, at least at the time. Um, but then, yes, I think that the, you know, we were talking about how it felt for you to walk into uh, a group of new people and some of the insecurities and the the finding your way through uh navigating your own feeling of like how much you um wanted to be the person that people didn't see um but instead the people that people saw you didn't want to talk about or the person people saw you didn't want to talk about um i think was a made for greater complexity in navigating how best to interact with you. So, yeah, and I, I don't think that was unique to you. I think that was probably unique to people who had less experience um, uh, communicating with people who were going through um, a traumatic life experience um, and, you know, and that person. Um, so, yeah, I think that was, uh, that made it um, challenging for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you, you know, feel think, like you have had experience? in dealing you could with people going through traumatic events before and have a better understanding of how to communicate with them 
Um, I think I've had some. I mean, I was I already had about ten plus years on most of our classmates, so I had some uh, greater potential exposure, one might say. Um, and yes, I've had some, but I don't think any were as close or in, in such close proximity. I mean, somebody at work, for example, would be um, a kind of person that you talk to every day, but there's also sort of like the work walls and barriers um, in terms of, you know, personal um, interaction that tend to uh, create a certain distance. Um, whereas, you know, we were talking about like with the, uh, the, the, uh, the beginning of a course year, it's very much intended to be throw everyone in the, in the stew pot and, you know, mix them all together. And the idea is that it's like, you know, there's no walls really. Um, yeah. and I think that in general, that group was pretty good at that. So, um, yeah, I don't think I'd had, um, sufficient experience to have prepared me in any way, but I think that I had some to give me context. Mm. Interesting. I, do you feel, I can think of like a couple of turning points um, in, I guess, how we got to know each other or how rather how we became friends. Um, you know, and really we haven't got very, very much further than like North Week of Oxford, but a lot happened between then and, and now. I, <laughs> And, and now, sure. Is, is, there a, is there an episode that stands out in your mind sort of next, if we kind of move forward chronologically, uh, that progression towards friendship? Yeah, well, I, there's, there's moments, but um, there's a cultural comment I'll make as well, which um, is when I think back in our group of uh, course mates, um, it seems to me, and it's possible with a different mixture of people, it would be different, um, but that the Americans um, almost stereotypically have a more forward approach to friendship, I think, um, as mm -hmm. certainly compared to other cultures and, dare I say, the Brits, um, <laughs> such that I think that it seemed to me that amongst our group, um, and here's my telephone, which is really loud. <laughs> we'll pause because it's absurdly loud. Call from Julie, Joe. Oh, well, Julie. Thanks, Julie. Oh. Okay. Great. Thanks, Julie. We're back. <laughs> um, yeah, so it seemed to me like the, uh, the Americans might have had a different approach. I mean, I'd be curious on your comment uh, on that or your observations, but um, which I think was a little bit more active in, you know, what is our, it was like, it was a conscious approach to friendship with you. And I don't, I don't, you know, you could say that you're, you have different uh, levels of friendship with each of the Americans from that class or other Americans you have, but it, it seemed to me like there was a conscious effort in how to actively um sort of slot you into like how we're going to be friends as opposed to um my own observations on on brits are just like it just sort of like washes over and you sort of you know like if you happen to become friends and that's nice but like it certainly doesn't happen right away it takes a lot of you know and these and like it just it's a very different approach to friendship i think so i, I think it's cross-cultural as well that's what i'm saying yeah that's that's really interesting um because now that you say it, yeah, like I think my experience is you kind of like you, being British, you kind of have to be like put into a room with someone enough times that like through sheer being next to someone for quite a long time and you have those conversations and then like, oh, we're friends rather than it sounds like you're saying, you know, I want to be friends with that person. I'm going to make sure I kind of talk to them today and tomorrow for like a good hour and probably by the end of that we are going to be friends which sounds perhaps like the kind of level of deliberateness deliberateness that's the word isn't it um that and, you and guys I, yeah and i don't mean to say that all of my compatriots do that the same way um or even do that at all but i think that on balance it's a more american approach to you know meeting somebody uh recognizing that there's some kind of friendship chemistry there and 
um, being either willing to pursue it or at least open to the fact that like um, maybe just a small bit of friendship chemistry is enough and that like and that's a comfortable level whereas I feel like in other cultures unless you get beyond a certain point of friendship um, it's never really considered friendship like a friendship almost like itself has a has a bar you have to cross whereas like in the United States like um, a a friendly casual acquaintance is still friendship but it's just maybe not you know close friends <laughs> yeah that's that is like two interesting things that um one i didn't realize that perhaps there was this level of deliberateness yeah it's almost it almost sounds quite premeditated the way <laughs> i'm hearing this that like you and like michelle and andrew and like sam were just like let's this guy he needs a friend like let's be friends with him let's let's target him and he i didn't you know i, I had no idea i was like oh this is nice well like, i don't i, I don't think that it I, i'm not saying that it was deliberate and calculated in that way i just mean that it like innately is more the kinds of things that some of us were thinking about and it wasn't just with you it was with others who um mm -hmm. had their own uh reasons to be reserved or more absent or something else it was it was a yeah. conscious and i think it was very much with that group dynamic dynamic of a few people um and other maybe it was just that i found other people who thought like me or thought mm -hmm. like i do um but i recall that it was it was not um at least in us in that small group of people um it was not just an individual approach to how um uh, each person was going to interact, but actually we thought about it and and spoke about it once that like, mm. you know, what what is the right thing to do and how mm. like what would be what would be a nice thing to do to make sure that he didn't feel like left out from this upcoming thing that we know he's going to miss. And it was just I think it was a really it was just a nice group of people that happened to think that way. I mean, I think our, we're very lucky with our course mates. They were I, I just a really super group and like we there's a very positive vibe I felt in the classes, which certainly like made it, it could have been so much worse and that would have made things I think much, much more difficult. Mm. Yeah, you could have joined a year later or a year earlier and it could have been, well, it certainly would have been different in lots of ways. Um, mm. In terms of moments, uh, I recall two moments um, before uh, our trip to Spain, which was obviously a, a much bigger moment we could talk about in a second, but two, mm. um, one was sort of a regular, I don't know how regular, but once in a while, kind of a invitation to breakfast, I think on Saturday mornings at your place one time, oh, yeah. or at least a couple of times you were able to introduce us to, uh, your girlfriend. At least one time you introduced, you introduced us to your grandfather. Um, Graham legend. He <laughs> has to come to this podcast because He's still, he's 86 and he still works out in the Middle East. If that's not like a tantalizer, then in bomb disposal, you know, he, he will be on later. Yeah, um, he's the man. Uh, I look forward to listening and watching to that uh, episode. Uh, so yes, there were, there were opportunities where it was almost like on your terms, you welcomed us into your space um, uh, for free flowing conversation and hearty breakfast. Um, with lots of nuts and berries and things like that and pancakes and pancakes um so yeah uh and then the, so that was one sort of group of um events and i don't remember exactly when that started it certainly wasn't the first week or two um probably yeah. more likely later november um and then into january mm -hmm. uh and then secondly and i don't remember exactly when it was um you worked with a couple of your your um, college mates uh, to at Worcester College to invite us over to dinner, and so we must have had maybe fifteen of the twenty three of us uh, join you um, there, which was just really nice. And again, it was sort of on your terms, and you hosted. And um, I think in that way, it was it was an invitation to more than. Uh, uh, before and after class um, conversations or questions about readings or um, whatever. I think it, it was, to, to me anyway, it was like a smoke signal that like you were open for um, more friendship if folks wanted to take you up on it. 
Yeah. yeah. But I think it that... helped that you did that. And I think if you hadn't done that, it would have been much more challenging for many people, uh, uh, including myself, to find the space and time for free flowing conversation rather than like necessarily one on one, like what am I supposed to say or whatever kinds of things that, that are, you know, anxious in, in given the situation. Yeah, that group setting can make it that much easier to have kind of less pressured conversation, much more relaxed conversation. Um, and it's, I didn't realize I wasn't conscious that this was a smoke signal. I, I guess for me, it was like something that was just like naturally happened because, which was a reflection of perhaps my mental state and like feeling kind of one more confident or whatever. And um, yeah, but I think it, you're, it's it probably, yeah, well, it was an accurate smoke signal, I guess. Um, and obviously just, it, it needs to be natural, but you know, I wonder if one takeaway from this is if somebody else is in a similar position or if I am in a similar position in the future, like that to me was helpful, like as a, you know, for a group of people that was that you may have been interested in having become more a part of your life. I think some degree of invitation on your own terms that made you comfortable allowed other people the opportunity to say yes to it and then to find their own ways of, of, you know, connecting with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember wanting to be, yeah, wanting to be social and, um, I guess having missed a lot and just, yeah, just be welcoming as well, I suppose. And be, be, uh, someone or like a, 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 something to bring the group together a that little bit more you know and promote like a nice group bond i felt that was yeah that was important i mean in fairness um, you didn't always make it easy right because uh before or after class many of us would find each other walking <laughs> to and fro um right. and your route to class and back was usually in some form of a run or sprint or something like that um, yeah. and I don't remember how many times, if almost at all, that you really ever went to lunch with us in between classes. And it's probably because you had your own thing that you wanted to eat, or maybe that's when you were able to get in a little bit of exercise or you had something else to do. I don't know, but a number of us would, you know, leave class, we'd have an hour or two in between, and it would be a opportunity to go and hang out in the common room or go to the university club or to the chemistry cafe. Mm. Or some place to, you know, have a chat over some spaghetti and salad or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, that's a very fair point. Um, I, I'd sort of forgotten about that. I think, um, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Part of me is quite independent, I suppose. And just sort of, I, I, I can't even remember what I was doing lunchtime. It was probably, I felt that was like my time. I, I think generally I was like, I didn't feel like I had time. This is terrible. I, friends are like, are incredibly important to me. And yet I guess I, as you do, and as many people do, you know, want to get stuff done. And I felt that probably I could get stuff done in that lunch hour, like emails or deadlines and other projects. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't make it easy. <laughs> uh, but it worked out mm. there was one moment that I really remember where I felt different that, that for me and I don't I'm just interested if you felt this and it was the first day back after Christmas and uh, at that point it must have been what like um, two or three months since I finished chemotherapy and I had this little bit of a fuzz on my hair and one of our classmates Rob was like oh, you got a little bit of hair there or something. Uh, I just kind of like rubbed my hair with my hand. And I was like, I don't, know, I don't want to say it. Like, yep, you know? And then to me, it was like, I felt that that second term, increasingly as it went on, I was a different person. I was a different person to the one that you'd seen before. But to me, I was becoming the person I had been previously before you knew me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, notice, it was noticeable. Um, 
I'm certain that it had to do with more than having a bit of hair on your head. Um, but that, I mean, it's really interesting. I didn't actually know until I learned from you that in addition to baldness, there's this swelling that tends to happen, right? Um, uh, so, I mean, it, to me, like you, you, you didn't just look like the same person with a bit of hair on your head, but you look like, I mean, you look different. I think it's because actually the shape of your head was not swollen or not, at least not nearly as much in that moment. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think there is, there was a, more than just uh, having a bit of hair on your head to me that was um, uh, different in appearance. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of your comfort and com confidence, um, it seemed to have changed um, as far as I could tell. And I think I, did, I don't recall hearing from others, but I wonder, I would imagine that they probably saw the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was never a shortage of provocative statements from you at the end of a class or a lecture about um, whatever the lecturer was talking about. But I, you know, I, I don't remember how different your statements were, or maybe were they more prolific um, in the spring because you had a little bit more of your, your, your grounding. I don't mm -hmm. recall. Yeah, I definitely, I think I felt, I think I felt more confident in speaking up and saying things. And I think before I kind of was a little bit, yeah, like wanted to not draw attention or kind of hide away a little bit more, I suppose. Um, and then, you know, I had to be in competition with Sam for saying the most provocative statement. So, um, it's, it's, it's a good competition to be in. I mean, it's, it's strong competition. Yeah. <laughs> Strong competition. I, I think Sam would be someone interesting to have on this podcast later as well. They're kind of, he's now in the army. He's this incredibly bright guy um, in the US Army. And it sounds like there's a bit of a challenge and intention there being kind of wanting to think and be intellectual in an environment that isn't conducive to it. So um, if you would like to hear that podcast, then do, do drop me a message and we will make it happen. Was that a message to Sam or to me? Um, other users, other, other listeners. users, other listeners. <laughs> in, in theory, if, it, if it makes a cut. Um, <laughs> um, so we we've we've gone into quite some detail about about a whole period of time when we weren't friends. Um, but when we went to Spain and we shared a room, that was that was a huge turning point. I feel, mm -hmm. and. It's interesting. I, there almost wasn't that, you know, we were talking about the challenges of friendship, the challenges of making friends. To me, it just sort of happened at that point. Do you see it more, um, more nuanced there? Or I know? think I'm, I'm willing. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, because uh, I don't know that the average roommate uh would have been willing to go running with you twice twice a day sometimes it wasn't twice a day every day but several days i, I joined you not once but twice and on for me anyway very long runs um and i think in many cases you continued on afterwards and added uh you know five to ten more miles um but in some cases uh we did the same thing together uh and i remember joking uh, probably with Andrew um, about this, but my tactic was to ask you questions so that you would have to run and speak, which in theory would be more taxing, which would allow me to breathe heavily and actually just focus on running. Um, and it allowed uh, hopefully the two of us to go at a more uh, uh, compatible uh, pace if you were not just running, but also talking. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know that the average roommate would have done those things. And I think if, um, but I was keen to do it. Um, and uh, I think having the runs uh, and the roommate time together, together made it just uh, uh, a more, more, more naturally, you know, just it happened more naturally, I guess. Mm. 
I feel like it, those, despite what you said, I feel those runs were the time when I actually got to know a lot more about you, about your stories. And, you know, you telling me about when you got dengue fever and like were sick in bed for weeks and basically almost died. And this and this whole other life that you'd had in French Guiana when you were like my age or younger, like this, um, you know, you don't look your age at all, but like you've you've done a lot. Um, and some of it was like 10 years ago, which is kind of weird. Um, you know, anyway. <laughs> um, so like hearing this other side, like all these other experiences that you had, I just hadn't been aware of. So that was like a are really um, getting to know what you were about in much more depth was because before that had just been sort of talking about the course really and like water management. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that's what friendship is, isn't it? It's a two way street. Mm. So um, absolutely. I think having the runs was the opportunity to have those conversations because on in the field work and things like that, we were, um, otherwise engaged and on the buses uh i was constantly moving around and talking to people and changing my seat uh which yeah. i like doing although it was harder to do that week i think it was easier to do in other buses but that particular bus people really got set set in their ways although it's not to say that the uh uh the bus or, or the classroom wasn't set in their ways everybody had their assigned seat except for me <laughs> and i i regularly um uh, made people very uncomfortable by taking their seat <laughs> and forcing them to go yeah. uh, somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, your seat was the roving seat. But I think that was really nice. Um, one of the things that added a nice positive twist to the, the classroom dynamics. Um, <laughs> so one thing that's like I'm trying to work out in my own mind right now is you know part of the theme of this podcast is about there being great challenges um and i guess in this context there were challenges in like us getting to know each other because i was quite recluse to an extent or like kept myself to myself you and i think other classmates didn't almost know how to deal with me um or you know what the right course of action might be the other side to this is trying to like work out where the opportunities are like what was it in your attitude that meant a friendship happened you know, uh, what might someone, you know, let's say someone else who's going through, um, you know, a big challenge, maybe it's sort of cancer or, you know, uh, body confidence issues or, you know, anything else. I'm trying to work out if there's a sort of a path to, to friendship or like ways that we both turn those challenges into something positive because we've now got like what I feel is an incredible friendship. That is probably a lot deeper because of your understanding of the challenges that I've been through um, and the fact that I felt safe telling you like some pretty personal things. And then maybe that's something that's kind of helped build a very strong friendship. Yeah. I'm really thinking on my feet here. You are. I mean, maybe you, that was all premeditated, but um, uh I think a lot of it has to do with making time. Um, and I think friends make time for friends. Uh, and if, I don't know, not everybody has to be as deliberate um, about it. You know, if you choose to want to make friends with somebody, um, you have to be able to find the time to invest in the friendship. Um, you know, there's some magic number like 120 like people that you can, the average person can more or less like keep within their universe at any given time uh, and probably no more than five really close friends. And of course, people slot in at different places throughout uh, a lifetime. Um, and so you, you have to be a little bit, well, I don't think you have to be choosy, but ultimately like as you make your daily and weekly annual decisions about how you end up sp spending your time, you, you're, those numbers end up involving and including different people um but yeah i think it's i think there's an intentionality that's really useful in terms of making time for friendships and i think um new friendships are difficult i think they're they're increasingly difficult for 
um, adults. Uh, I think they're increasingly even more so uh, complicated for adult men. Uh, it was a really interesting article, which I wonder if I could dig up and you could share with uh, your oh, podcast please. viewers um, about the challenges. I think it's adult men in America in particular who are expected to have all their stuff figured out and then, all you know, especially like their emotions bottled up and, um, you know, the, 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 um, the image of a strong man is one who, you know, sort of just cracks on and does his thing and doesn't really, you know, need anything. And yet if you're in a position where that's not fulfilling enough, uh, um, and you would like to make a new friend, it's actually culturally really challenging to do um, in some environments. So, I mean, I feel quite fortunate that I was in a university setting last year uh, with you and others. And so that to me, like gave me, I don't know, a, an immediate injection of 80 new friends <laughs> or something. Um, yeah. But certainly in my um, professional life, living in Washington DC prior to that, um, you know, it felt like increasingly so that people were sort of spinning off with their partners and their children and headed to the suburbs and things like that. And so I think that comes for a lot of people in their um, in their 30s and uh, into their late 30s. And so I think that that's that's a real challenge. Oh, this is going to need quite some editing, but. <laughs> Oh well, it's a really good. I'm really enjoying the conversation. Um, can you hear this? It's my grandma on the hot phone. Well, I can hear that there's someone speaking. Okay, I think that's it's dead. Um, so um, anyway, I could pick up where I was. 30, in your late thirties, um, you know, in your thirties, late thirties, people are spinning off. Um, and is that much more difficult to make friends? I, I mean, I definitely think so, but I don't think it's necessarily to do with age. I think it's to do with life stage. So I have friends who at 22 were married and by 24 had children and, you know, their life stage of parenting and moving to the suburbs or whatever the, you know, it's not what everybody does, but it's certainly what the average, um, family tends to do, at least in the U S um, came earlier. So it's not really an age thing, but it's a life stage. Um, I mean, that's one comment around like, what are the challenges or opportunities in your life stage? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's having a diversity of friendships across different life stages, I think helps to, it really helps. Um, uh, one of my best friends, uh, has a grandmother who she just turned a hundred. She's, she's a plus or minus two on a hundred and she has uh she goes to like 40th birthday parties and she goes to um uh intellectual conversations um uh like like friday nights with wine and talking like a book club kind of thing and she has friends at all kinds of age groups and that allows her to feel old if she wants to because she you know she has a certain age and she has some friends um who are in the much older age bracket but she also has friends in their, you know, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and um, it allows her to sort of float through life, you know, with a group that sort of matches her feeling and her mood. And I think that's something that we don't off, we don't do enough is to allow ourselves relationships that sort of match different moments that we might feel like we're in throughout a given day, uh, month, or year. Wow, I I love this thought. It's not something I've ever really consciously thought about before. Like, but having, yeah, having groups of different, um, having friends who are at different life stages who can, who can allow you to, um, I guess, be a different side of yourself with, and all of those sides are sort of important. And I guess maybe, do you think this becomes more important as, as you grow a bit older? Because like, let's say, you know, your teenage years, I kind of, the only people I wanted to were the only people who were my friends were like other teenagers. And as, you know, okay, late teens, early 20s, it begins to expand a little bit, you know, upwards, I'd say, to maybe people 25. But then, like, I guess, 
maybe when I was about 21, 22, I started having friends who were like 10 years older and then there wasn't that. And you still realize you're both adults, but they have different perspectives, which are really interesting and they can be really fun. And that was really valuable. I don't have that many friends who are, say, 60 or 70. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes with adulthood that you have increasing exposure to people of all different age groups and that you can all be adults. Um, I'm not saying I have tons of friends in all of those categories, but um, I feel fortunate to have had the opportunity through um, professional experiences and through um, different types of social organizations, my parents and their friends and their, their church and things like that to have a, a number of people at different ages that I interact with. Um, and I feel, you know, I feel like that's been really nice for me. And I think, but I think it's easier to go up. It's harder to go down um, in age because you assume that everyone treats you as the old person. Um, and you assume that you are not, you know, able to do or, think I maybe mean, not think but not able to just be the way that you used to be 10 years you don't have to be the way you were 10 years ago to be able to connect with 20 somethings so I, i've got to ask you jeremy like how do you do it you're in your late 30s and yet i feel that i'm interacting you know you you, you could be you could be 25 for all that i you know for, for all i know you definitely seem to be able to connect with people who are you know, significantly younger. And I dare say you, you go out clubbing a hell of a lot more than I do um, and have many more wild nights than me. Um, so how, how do you do it? Well, I don't know that there's a method per se. I think part of it is wiring. Um, maybe not everybody's wired the way I'm wired, and that's probably true for every individual. Um, but I just, I find it enriching to um, connect with people at different age groups. But I, I think in even more than anything, I find that I look for energy in relationships. Um, and as people enter certain life phases where they're decreasing in energy, it's not energy, right? It's, it's energy in the relationship um, because they're maybe focused their energy in other places. Um, uh, I still crave more of it. Uh, and so if I can't get it in those places, I still invest in those friendships. Um, um, but it often tends to be that I bring the energy into that relationship and that there's, you know, it's reciprocated when I'm present, but then it's not there when I'm not. Uh, and that's okay with me. It's not okay with others. I know some people who, you know, if they don't feel like the friendship is um, is 50-50 on effort, then it's not worth it to them. I don't see the world that way. I see, you know, if you look into your closet and you see the, uh, uh, the items of clothing that spark joy, then you keep them. And if you, if they don't spark joy, I don't throw them in the waste bin. I just maybe don't prioritize wearing them. So yeah, maybe my closet is fuller of, of friends that I'm willing to, you know, to dial up, um, at a different moment. Um, but again, I think it, it, it requires a certain openness to recognize that um, you're not always looking for the same things in friends and friendships. Yes. But, right. And so when you're in a certain moment of looking for something different, you might um, choose, you know, you can look, you can open up that wardrobe and you probably have tons of people that you've met in your life that actually would be a better match for how you're feeling and what you need in this particular moment. Um, and I think a lot of people, at least in my own estimation, seem to be scared by it. You know, that like, oh, well, they wouldn't want to hear from me. Or there's that amazing amount of effort that people feel like they have to put into that first contact that they, you know, and after a long time, it's like, oh, I have to write, you know, a 10 paragraph email <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. Um, and I just, I think um, that those are major barriers that, um, could be overcome with like a bit of a Steve Jobs approach of a two sentence, you know, email or what is the a Steve quick Jobs phone call. Approach? Exactly. What would his uh, two sentences be? Well, I don't know what, what they would be, but basically if you can't convey it and I'm totally misquoting Steve Jobs here, mm -hmm. but if you can't convey it in like two 
simple sentences and like fewer than 50 words, then it's, you know, then you're failing. Right. And so the, I, and, it, and yes, Oscar Wilde says, if I had more time, I would have made this shorter. So yeah, it can take a while to edit something down, but it's not about editing. It's more about recognizing that it doesn't need to be filtered. You don't have to create a 10, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to be a full presentation of your yesteryear, but you could just say, Hey, it's been a long time. And I've, um, I was thinking about you. Here's, um, you know, wouldn't it be fun to catch up? Which I think actually people are doing much more of in this confinement period. Yeah, right. I think that is that is um, one potential upside from it that we have been able to reach out to people, and there's been more like acceptance of it. Perhaps that that's something people are doing. Yeah, I also definitely relate to having different friends who I do different things with, and I. Um, love hanging out with a lot of different groups of friends or different people um, in very different ways and I feel that you know you have you know it's I think it's absolutely fine to have some friends that you'll party with others that you have a, a deep conversation with others that you'll play sport with um, that's that's all part of the, the the tapestry of relationships I suppose but it's definitely thought provoking about, you know, how actually how we feel it's so difficult to rekindle friendship. But actually, like nine times out of 10, at least from my own experience, when someone like reaches out to me, I'm always like delighted to I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, let's let's chat. Great idea. Um, although it can feel daunting. But then, like, what do you lose, I suppose, at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. You know, all you're going to get is no or, like, just no response. So, And I yeah. suppose maybe there's something about vulnerability of rejection in there, you know, kind of not wanting, you know, putting yourself out and then not getting the response that you hope for, whether then people can feel um, foolish, perhaps, or kind yeah. of like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I mean, an interesting example um, that I just went through in the last week was um, uh, my dad just celebrated his 70th, 70th um, birthday. And I th uh, in confinement, it's hard to have a party. Um, <laughs> and my brother and I decided that it would be fun to collect some happy birthday videos from his friends. And I know that if I had asked him who to ask, he would have given me a very different list than the one that I ended up pursuing. And of course it was a surprise. So I didn't ask him at all. Um, mm -hmm. But I looked back at a list of people that he was sending Christmas letters to some 15 years ago. Um, and I didn't send it to everybody, uh -huh. but I happened to find it. And it gave me some ideas that like, Oh, here's people that I remember either knowing through my life and they would not be surprised. It would not be completely crazy. I mean, I think they were surprised, but it wouldn't be completely crazy for them to have received um, an outreach from me. And it turns out that um, many of these people who I guess um, maybe are not, I don't know if he's writing Christmas letters to them now, or he certainly doesn't ex make phone calls or receive phone calls very often with some of these people, but he was just really surprised and touched to have received a message because it was, you know, the door was open to submit something and you know there was quite a few that came in and he said oh wow you know i haven't talked to that person in ages it was like amazing that they replied it's like well i don't know maybe it was just that they didn't they didn't have an invitation um to be a part mm -hmm. of your life and if you are interested in being open to it i think it only takes a small gesture i wonder if we're almost coming around to a little bit of a sort of a, a not a conclusion as such as such a wide topic, but a kind of a parting thought of sorts is this idea of openness. And like so often either when, you know, there's someone that we kind of perhaps want to be friends with, but we're worried about, you know, getting rejected. Um, but actually so often, you know, like people, you know, you know people will be very positive as a response if you kind of reach out to them. Um, and if you're kind of feeling, as I was, you know, quite insecure and, you know, high group, there's probably, you know, people that, that mm, there probably isn't much to be, often there's not that much to be worried about, I suppose. Or, you know, people actually want to just be friends. And there's a, 
it, it seems that so often basically both parties are under the misconception that the other party doesn't want to speak. And as soon as one party kind of reaches out, suddenly things start happening. And that's perhaps when when friendship is kindled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so much of um, the friction in life is built around assumption that we know what the other person is thinking or what the other person wants. And I'm not an expert. I've blundered a number of <laughs> relationships. Uh, but I think that the uh, the reality is that you just don't know what the other people want. And if you're open to it, I think it's your responsibility to help others see that you're open. Mm, yeah. Yes, I think that there's something in here as well. Yeah, about taking taking responsibility for your actions, taking control. And maybe that's the opportunity. You know, seize the opportunity of saying, I'm open for a friendship. You know, like take that step. Uh, rather than waiting for for something to happen, which is definitely what I have do a lot. It's like when I've been traveling, I'm like, maybe someone will start talking to me rather than flipping it around and saying, well, actually, what's the worst that can happen if I start talking to them? And that might, I think that's something I'm going to take away from this conversation and hopefully uh, for my psyche ride as I continue. That sounds good. Yeah, I think you should. <laughs> and, and maybe that's... Um, if it's a challenge that um, anyone listening to this wants to take on uh, in COVID times, it's a bit more difficult, but um, thinking about actually taking that little risk and saying, I'm open, I'm open for a conversation. I'm open for friendship um, and seeing, seeing where that takes you. Yeah. I think it would manifest in very different ways with different people in different times, but yeah. What does the openness look like for you and your life at this time? I think it's a good question to ask, especially yeah. if, if you are open, because maybe you're not. But, you know, I think many of us are. Yeah. And how, how do we do that, perhaps particularly in this time of COVID, mm -hmm. when actually we probably need friendship and communication and company more than any other time because we have so little. So how do we let our neighbours know that we're open? How do we let that person that you always see when you're out running but at two meters, like, how can we have a, you know, a conversation at a safe social distance, but before you just keep on running past that person, you just never, you know, confident enough, at least that would be my own way of thinking about it, my experience of just saying, hey, like, tell me about that race that you did that's on your t-shirt, <laughs> you know, something like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe it, maybe the solution is just wear it on your sleeve, right? Wear it take on it back, sleeve. take it back to the beginning of our conversation. <laughs> and that's nicely done. That that's why you're on here to to make things wrap up nice and neatly in a circle. <laughs> Any parting thoughts, Jeremy? Uh, nothing, nothing too profound. Uh, but I loved talking to you and to be an early guest on your on your podcast uh, video show. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. It's been, it's been a real pleasure chatting to you. It's also been thought provoking. Um, I'm definitely going to take away this idea of having a diversity of friends across different life stages and also about being, putting those tendrils out, being more conscious about putting those tendrils out of I am open, open for business, open for friendship. Um, and I guess the next stage is putting that into practice. And maybe that sounds like we should have Brené Brown on this podcast for that. I think so. <laughs> right. There's a project. Anyone who knows Brené Brown, get in touch. <laughs> Brené Brown, get in touch. <laughs> if you don't know who Brené Brown is, she's got the most awesome TED Talk. And check it out. Um, Jeremy, thank you so much. Thank you, Luke. Um, Take care, and um, we're about to do a workout session, so I'll see you in a few minutes. Off we go. All right. Ciao. Ciao.